Not very many companies are good at being secretive and extremely successful. But what if we told you that there is one such company, secretive but also successful? Chances are, you have tasted one or several of its products at this point in your life. It could be a beer, coke, or anything salted, preserved, sweetened, or with added texture, or even an egg from McDonald's as the largest commodity traders in the world, with over 155,000 employed staff, $108 billion generated yearly, and a worldwide production that covers candy bars, pretzels, canned soup, yogurts, and ice cream. We present to you the company and the family business Cargill. So buckle up, get your popcorn ready, and get comfortable as we take you into the story of the dark secret of Cargill and its family. To begin, we head to Canaver, Iowa, where it all began. We at Business Chronicles tell successful business stories. Please subscribe to our channel to help us make more videos. Born William Wallace Cargill on December 15, 1844 in Port Jefferson, New York. William was the third child of seven children. His father, a Scottish sea captain named William Dick Cargill, came to New York in the late 1830s because of his mother, Edna Davis, was a native of New York. By 1856, William's partners moved to Janesville in Wisconsin to start an agriculture life. And that was the beginning of great things to come. The start of Cargill Company could be tracked back to the end of the 18th century. Precisely, 1865, when William Cargill founded the company, Cargill Incorporation. At the end of the Civil War in the US, William owned a single grain storage warehouse, which was at the end of a rather lonely rail line in Lime Springs, Conover, Iowa. Two years later, in 1867, two of William Cargill's younger brothers, Sam and Sylvester, joined him in the business. At the time, grain warehousing was particularly new due to the nature of farming. Back then, most of the farmers lacked the essential resources to store and preserve their products. Putting them at the mercy of transportation and market prices, the issue was since they couldn't transport their grains in a timely manner, they became exposed and would end up getting rotten. It was either that, or they ended up selling it at a very discounted price, since they were not able to move it again. William Cargill took the note of this and decided to offer a fair rate to farmers for their grain, which would then be stored in his warehouse until it was the right time to sell them for a better and more profitable price. As the railway gradually moved to the west, Cargill followed. Building more warehouses for his business, grain elevators and even terminals, with three of them in Minnesota alone. In 1895, another notable family, the Macmillan family, joined the ranks with the Cargills when William Wallace's daughter, Edna, married Joan Macmillan. Williams Cargill retired from the day-to-day -day running the company in 1904 after suffering a stroke. In October 1909, he became extremely ill during a trip to Montana. And after returning home, he was treated, but eventually died of pneumonia on October 17, 1909. After his death, the entire business was to be handed over to his wife by Lowe. However, she died on March 23, 1910, while it was going through probate. As a result of this event, the Cargill Company was equally divided among his children, with his son-in-law John McMillan taking over the Cargill Company as president in 1912. After taking over the reins of the company, Macmillan quickly noticed that it was over-leveraged and was facing major challenges. After a failed investment, the company made in an irrigation project in Montana and has left the company's finances in a critical state. In order to keep the company afloat and running, as well as the banker's confidence, Macmillan decided to reconstruct the company. He renegotiated the company's loans, extended the payment debts, and sold off all parts of the company that were less profitable. The next move he made was one that had a lasting impact on the Cargill company for years to come. He initiated a change in the company's leadership structure by giving the Macmillans and Lowe's controlling shares in the companies, while the Cargill family members were given the position of minority shareholders. Within six years of making these changes, Cargill Inc. had completed paying off all its debt and was on the rise again. From the early 19th century to the 20th century, Cargill Incorporation made several huge bets in technologies and markets. In 1923, 
The company bought a grain merchandising company with a private wire communication system, giving it a strong competitive edge over the others at that time. In 1928, Cargill, seeing increased success, opened its first operation in Montreal, Canada. Called Cargill Grain Company Limited, it was headquartered in Winnipeg and employed over 8,000 people. Despite its giant strides, Cargill Inc. soon started to face several criticism, and the biggest being its perceived arrogance. The aggressive management style employed by the Macmillans led to a dispute with the Chicago Trade Board that lasted several decades. It all began when the board refused to grant membership to Cargill in 1934. The decision later was overturned when the United States government nullified the board's ruling, forcing them to accept Cargill Incorporation as a member. When the 1936 crop corn failed and the 1937 crop became unavailable till October that year, the Chicago Board of Trade ordered Cargill to sell some of its corn, an order that Cargill refused to comply with. The next action from the trade board was retaliation. In collaboration with the United States Commodity Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade accused Cargill Incorporation of an attempt to corner the entire corn market. And by the following year, in 1938, the board suspended Cargill Incorporation and three of its officers from the trading floor. When the dispute was later resolved and the board lifted its suspension after some year, Cargill Incorporation opted against rejoining. Instead, they insisted on carrying out their trade activities through independent traders. After the end of World War II, the company diversified its activity, acquiring an oilseed processing plant for soybean meal and feed businesses. From 1950 to 1980, Cargill Incorporation continued its fast-growing and several aggressive expansions around the world. But so it set up a different separate companies in Asia and Europe while developing a centralized development and research arm of the company. The family decided to switch things up by the 1960s and for the first time hired an outsider, Erwin Kelm, to run Cargill Incorporations. Erwin led the company's modernization entering into new markets. Erwin's aim for expansion into downstream production saw him lead the company into milling, syrups and searching. As the company continued to grow, it created a market intelligence network for coordinating its product trading, processing, shipping and freight and its future businesses. Before the introduction of the electronic mailing system, Cargill Incorporation used its telex-based system for communicating internally. These advances under Erwin Kelm saw the company see a $5 billion growth in sales, making it the biggest agricultural trader in the world. By the 1970s, when the Soviet Union entered the market, the demand for grains rose by an exponential level, but Cargill benefited hugely. In 1963, Cargill had previously negotiated a $40 million deal with the USSR. The deal built relationships between both parties for large deals to come. The last member of the Cargill family who ran the company was Whitney Macmillan, who took over in 1976 with revenues bearing $30 billion. He oversaw a huge expansion of the company's products lines into several industries, including coffee, cocoa, chemicals, financial services, poultry, petroleum, peanuts, wool, rubber and steel. By then, the US government had placed extreme pressure on the biggest exporters of grains with direct allegations that they were manipulating the market. Cargill was one of the main targets, but it came out without any severe changes. In 1978, Cargill bought the largest Leslie salt refining from Schilling. It was located in Noir, California, the following year, Cargill Incorporations ventured into the meat processing market when it acquired beef processor MBPXL, which later became Excel. The division expanded into Turkey, food services and food distribution businesses, and now known as the Cargill Meat Solutions. Cargill further expanded its ventures again in 1986, when it began its operation in Venezuela by partnering with the Pazenti family, Memesa C.A to establish an agro-industrial memesa in Maracaibo, which was dedicated to manufacturing pasta and flour. The agriculture market has become dominated by several crops like maize, soya and whey in the last 50 years. And according to Eric Millstone, a professor of science policy at the University of Sussex, 
The extent to which cargo drove, it is difficult to ascertain since so much of their trading was opaque. But they have made good business out of it, and it played a dominant role in airing and homogenizing plants around the world. For years to come, cargo remained notoriously quiet in its dealings. We'd rarely hear anything about the Cargill and Macmillan family controlling the company. As of today, roughly 100 members of the Cargill and Macmillan families control about 88% of the company's entire shares. One of its darkest secrets has been heavily guarded. The remaining 12% of the company consists of employee stock ownership plans and shares belonging to the management. What we are about to tell you next will probably come as a shock. Cargill Incorporation pays the entirety of its family members 20% of its total dividends return. While the balance is constantly reinvested back into the company's operation, compared to the other family companies, where the payout often gets as high as 50% of the companies in the S&P 500. The Cargill family members receive very little. They have committed to focusing more on the company's long-term growth plan over the immediate gain and benefits. Here comes the interesting part of the company's secret. Over the years, the harmony between Macmillan's and Cargill's has sometimes been a major issue, despite the visible success of the company, like most family-controlled businesses. There has been some occasional tension and disputes over the company's influence. Some members of the Cargill family strongly believe that their business, originally founded by a Cargill, has been stolen from them. On the other hand, the Macmillans believe that their efforts in saving the business have gone unnoticed and aren't properly appreciated. However, the conflict between both factions of the family successfully highlighted the need for them both to come together with a single vision for the company's success and growth. As a result, in 1991, they established Way Cross, a family office that serves the interests of both parties. Waycross was originally established to provide only professional and financial advice to the family. But today, it organizes several educational and training programs for three living generations, while also actively working to ensure all members of the company who aren't working are introduced to and engaged with the business through meetings, education programs, task forces and planned tours. The Cargill Company is a huge company, with owners now in the seventh generation. According to reports from Bloomberg, 14 members of the Cargill family are reported billionaires, as it is one of the largest concentration of wealth in any family-controlled businesses anywhere in the world. Despite the success of each generation of the family, the Cargill ownership pie reduces with each generation. A parent member who once owned one-ninth of the entire company may now have to split their share among three, four, or even five children. Many privately held companies have gone public at a similar stage at this, with the younger members of the family developing less attachment to the business and opting to take a massive payout and leave. However, the current CEO of Cargill Incorporation has stated that the Cargill family has no intention of making the company public anytime soon. Herein lies another dark secret of the company's operation. The total shareholder equity of the company was valued at $33 billion in 2018. But despite that, some of the shareholders have been struggling to even obtain a mortgage because of the assets are not liquid. Rather, they are tied up in some company shares. On some occasions, Cargill Incorporation has had to deal with some family members regarding their inability to cash out some of their shares. The situation was resolved once in 1992 when Cargill Incorporation set up an employee stock plan that allowed family shareholders to sell up to 17% of their stock for $700 million. Also in 2006, the family was faced with a similar issue. But this time, it was due to the death of a family member, Margaret A. Cargill, who happened to own the largest shares in the company. Margaret owned 17% of the company and died without any heir, so her share went into a trust. With the Mac Foundation becoming the primary beneficiary, before her death, Cargill Incorporation had identified the need to and concluded the family meeting and company's investment and liquidity needs while also staying private. At the start of the 21st century, Warren Stalley was appointed the CEO of Cargill Incorporation, a move that rebounded. Stalley chased a new strategy that was quite different from the solutions-oriented enterprise approach that was widely known. 
he adopted an asset-intensive commodities company approach that many people found unsatisfying. While he expanded the company, Staley also refocused the company by selling off its assets, such as its rubber and coffee business. In 2002, Cargill bought European-based Tosh manufacturer Searstar from Montedison for a whooping $1.1 billion. By the following year, Cargill had gotten over $50 billion in its annual sales, a figure that was twice the reported by its arch rival, Archer Daniel Midland. Cargill also had nearly 100,000 employees running in 1,000 production sites across 59 countries. In 2003, one arm of Cargill Incorporation, Cargill Meat Solutions, bought Milwaukee and Pack and merged it with Taylor Packing Co., which it had purchased earlier in 2001. In 2004, Cargill Incorporations established Mosaic, a company producing fertilizer. It was a merger between the existing Cargill Fertilizer Operation and a firm that was listed publicly, making it the first time that any part of Cargill Incorporation was publicly listed. Margaret's foundation, Mac, eventually decided to diversify its holdings and get rid of a large share it had in Cargill. So Cargill made an offer with Mosaic, agreeing to trade off its position in the firm. As part of the deal, about 12 billion Mosaic shares were transferred to the Mac Foundation and other members of the family who were shareholders in exchange for Margaret's 17% stake in Cargill. But that wasn't all. From the sale of Mosaic, Cargill used another $7 billion to pay off some of its debts. In 2007, Warren Stanley stepped down from his role as CEO and was replaced by Gregory R. Page. By 2008, Cargill Incorporation, which started out as one frontier outpost in Conover, Iowa, had grown to become one of the world's largest privately held companies, employing over 100,000 people across 70 countries. It has a fleet of over 550 ships that moved around 200 million tons of commodities each year. Its quarterly profit passed the $1 billion mark for the first time in the company's history during the quarter ending on February 29, 2008. The 86% rise in the company's profit was due to the global food shortages and the expanding biofuel industry that caused an increased demand for Cargill's core areas of technology and agricultural commodities. Over time, the company's economic and political intelligence on agriculture and food have been set to elude the CIA which further shows how notably the company is for its privacy. The Cargill family's 88% ownership of the company gives it a very strong cloak of invisibility that we can assume that the company decided what it chooses to share with the public. Interestingly, a majority of the world's primary agricultural commodities pass through the hands of just four international trading corporations, and Cargill Incorporation is one. The company has deep roots anywhere food is preserved, sweetened, milled, emulsified or imbued with additives and is present in several stages of these processes, making it capable of dominating different sectors. For instance, with soya, Cargill might purchase beans from farmers in Brazil, then store them in cargo silo and transport them across the ocean using cargo leased ships to feed their mill. When there, they truck the resulting animal feed to cargo contracted chicken farm. As the 20th century marked key moments for Cargill family business, some new and dark secrets were also revealed that the family would have preferred had it stay hidden. In 2005, the company found itself in the middle of serious child trafficking allegations. The International Labor Rights Fund filed a suit against Cargill, Archer Daniels Midland and Nestle in a federal court. The suit was on behalf of several children who claimed they were trafficked from Mali into Côte d'Ivoire and made to work against their will. On a cocoa bean plantation for about 13 hours daily and with very little food and sleep. And worse still, no pay coupled with physical abuse. In October 2011, the United States Department of Justice announced that a cargo biotechnology specialist had pleaded guilty to information theft. The Justice Department stated that the biotech specialist, Kuk Huang, was stealing information from Cargill and Doe AgroSciences and was passing the secrets back to China. The 46-year-old, also known as John, started working at Cargill Way's database after previously spending five years as a scientific researcher at Doe. When he was hired, Cargill didn't know that Wang had a record of stealing Doe's secrets. He had an indictment record that included five different instances of property and a dozen other theft of trade secrets. 
He sold the secrets to the same potential cargo competitors in China through Germany. According to the details in his plea agreement, in 2008, while working in Minnesota, Wang learned of a secret project in cargo to create a new food product. The court papers didn't state the detail of the product, and neither did cargo. But in order to manufacture the product, cargo depended on an enzyme with code name BD24910. The plea deal further revealed that in 2009, Wang made a copy of the DNA sequence on a flash drive, violating Cargill's policy. Six months later, he sent a copy of the DNA sequence via email to a student researcher at a university in China. Between 2010 and 2012, Cargill was involved in a cover-up pertaining to land grabbing in South America, Colombia. An NGO, Oxfam, documented a very illustrative case against the agro-giants. It claimed that between a two-year period of 2010 and 2012, Cargill bought a large area of land under its jurisdiction, despite legal restrictions against such manner of land acquisition. In order to achieve this, Cargill established about 36 mailbox companies that helped it to prescribe the maximum size of land ownership legally. So Cargill acquired land measuring 50,000 hectares, 30 times more than the legally accepted limit. In 2019, the allegations of child abuse and trafficking were back again. A TV program on the popular French channel, France 2, released a report about illegally harvested cocoa from protected areas in Côte d'Ivoire. The report showed that child labor was widespread on the investigated plantations. As every third worker was a child, there were also instances of child trafficking from neighboring countries like Burkina Faso. Cargo, which purchases from these plantations that were investigated, First, denied that it had done business with them, but was later forced to admit that its traceability system didn't cover those areas. So it couldn't perform a full trace on the origin of its cocoa in question. However, according to a Swiss TV channel, RTS reports, Cargo sold most of its cocoa sourced from Côte d'Ivoire to Nestlé, a Swiss-based food giant. Even with its success, Cargo does have some really dark secrets behind its closet that the general masses aren't totally aware of. Regardless of the dark secrets in Cargill, the company has continued to grow bigger, and despite the differences, the Macmillan and Cargill families have constantly worked together with the sole interest of growing the company, proof of their focus on the long term to keep the company afloat and as one of the most notable institutions in the world. The pressure to make the company public will undoubtedly return, but the company's pledge of vigilance to address this issue will prove vital. As the Cargill and Macmillan family continues to expand, more and more shareholders will hold a much lesser share of the company than the predecessors, making family liquidity an ongoing concern for everyone involved. This is, however, the biggest and darkest secret of the Cargill family. If you enjoyed the video, do leave a like and subscribe to this channel for more interesting stories about your favorite companies, families and people.